Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, again today for this new episode of our Cinda Thursday Thought Leadership Series. So uh, uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm uh, at the end of my day and Chris is starting his day today from uh, sunny California. So uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, today, we're really glad to welcome Chris Coffey, who is VP of Brand and Product at Duda. And Chris is going to drive us through a very important subject, which is about the new uh, algorithm and, and changes that uh, Google uh, is going to make or is in the process of making, and especially the focus that Google is doing on the user experience for 2021. So really key features to uh, to think about, and, uh, and this drives all the uh, digital transformation also of the small businesses that we've been talking about for, for a year now. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris. So thanks very much, Chris. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Kimberly. And thank you, everybody uh, at Cinda. If folks are um, not familiar with Duda, we are a professional website builder. You can call your own. So if you are uh, working with your clients, um, want to make sure that you know folks know Duda is is white level ready, uh, extremely powerful editor, lots of tools in there for team collaboration and client management, and uh, we were just ranked number one for being most likely to recommend by G2 in the most recent uh, survey that uh, that they did in their most recent uh, quarterly report. Uh, additionally, uh, we just found out that our customer support and service team won the Gold Stevie Award for uh, 2021 as best uh, frontline customer service team of the year uh, for the, the technology and the industry that they were looking for. So I um, want to go through a number of different things today. So first is make sure that we are covering sort of what's changing and you know there's been a lot of change over the last year as we moved uh, through covid and we're starting to move into 2021 google is making a lot of different changes and having a couple of significant updates to their ranking factors that we'll talk through as well website behavior has changed significantly in the way customers and visitors are interacting with businesses through their websites and then talk through some actual tangible and tactical things that folks can do either for themselves or with their uh, with their clients as they are working through updating websites for uh, for folks so let's talk through what's changing for website strategy first is visitors now really expect updates they really expect communication they really expect all of the things that are um, up to date on the website are actually up to date they need dynamic information around things like opens and closes and hours and protocols and the like there is a lot more interaction that is happening through the website now so it used to be that um, the web, website was okay just being a brochure, but now it is really around process and interaction as well and needs to tie in and connect with all of the other systems of the business. So it used to be that you know, once every couple or three years, you could update your website and that was uh, good enough. Now really need to be thinking about up to the minute and up to date website um, changes to address the the customer needs that are are coming forth so as far as ranking factors for google there are a couple of different things that are are coming down the pike this year first is a really new focus on user experience and so that is something that we'll talk through in a little bit more detail it really 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 matters as folks are interacting with your site that they have a good experience and Google looks at a number of different factors in order to uh, to set that up. There are two big changes that are coming down the line. The first is what they're calling mobile first indexing. That's actually going to hit by the end of this month, March 2021. And then the other is uh, the Core Web Vitals update, which I'll talk through in a, a lot more detail uh, after that. So with respect to mobile first indexing, Google looks at the desktop version of 
the site when it is indexing and figuring out where it should rank. It's also looking at the mobile version of the site. And they started looking at this a, a few years ago now. They have announced that by the end of March 2021, this mobile first approach is going to be the way that they are indexing all of their sites. And so you can see where uh, you or your clients or customer sites, which sort of version of the indexing that Google is using. You can go into Google Search Console. If you go down to settings and then see which crawler Google is using, it will tell you if it's um, you know smartphone based, that's the, the mobile first version. And you can see, for example, for our site, it has been looking at that for a, a couple of years at this point, but they are going to be cutting all of their uh, sort of primary indexing and analysis down on that mobile site by the end of this month, uh, according to what's being said out uh, out in the, the search engine optimization community. And so if your site is not designed for mobile, it is not set up for mobile, it is not tuned for mobile, uh, folks may start seeing a reduction in uh, traffic from organic search if they have not been historically using the mobile first uh, index for, for your site. If they've been using desktop first and switch over and the site isn't mobile optimized, um, you may see some, some impact there. Um, the bigger thing, and this is, this is really different for Google, the bigger thing that's happening this year is um, they're really starting to focus on page experience. So, what they say is the overall experience that a visitor has with the page, it is looking at how those users perceive their interaction with the page. So how long does it take to load? How sort of snappy is it when you try to do something on the page? How stable is the page from a, a visual point of view? Is it secured by HTTPS? Um, to make sure that the interactions between the browser and the, the server are encrypted while they're in transit. Um, are there things happening like intrusive ads that are coming down and covering up the entire page and those types of things that really are negative effects for the, for the page experience? Those are all things that Google is going to start to look at and um, you know we do have a blog post at uh, if you go to blog.tutor.co uh, google dash page dash experience go into a lot of these details but i really want to hit on some of these things around core web vitals first um, because this is a whole new set of signals that google is bringing in this year and this is different for Google because they announced this about a year ago at this point, I believe it was in May of last year, and sort of pre-announced, hey, this thing is coming down the line, which is a little bit different and a little bit strange for them. Historically, they have not always done that, but what they are doing now is they've signposted all of these different new signals that they're going to be looking at in this user experience area around Core Web Vitals and are communicating that out. And so the first of these things is a concept called largest contentful paint or LCP. And what this is looking at is when someone comes to the page, you've got a bunch of stuff sort of in the in the viewport in the uh, in the top of the page. And whatever the biggest thing is up there from size, whether it's a big image, whether it's a video, whether it's a big block of text, whatever that largest image is, however long it takes to load up to the browser, that amount of time is what Google is calling largest uh, contentful paint. And what they're looking for is they want that LCP to be two and a half seconds or less. Um, if it's two and a half seconds or less, they'll call it good. If it's between two and a half seconds and four seconds, they'll give it sort of the yellow light. And if it's more than four seconds, they're going to call it poor. And if you go to web.dev, which is a Google site that tracks all of the changes they're making in this core web vitals area, and actually has an online testing tool you can use to test your own site or your client sites, that is a place where you can see what those scores are. Um, the ways that if you are in the yellow or the red on LCP, there are a couple of things you can do. Um, 
depending on where the site is hosted, uh, you can try to speed up server response time to just get the server to start pushing things uh, down the pipe faster. Can optimize images, and what that means is um, have them have a predefined size on the screen so the browser doesn't need to figure that stuff out. Um, you can optimize the image size. So sometimes you might you know, have an image that might be you know, many, 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 many thousands of pixels wide in its sort of HD form. Um, you might be able to optimize that down to a form that still works fine on screen, but doesn't lose the visual crispness that you're looking for. Um, you can do things like use a content delivery network, which caches web pages all around the world and tries to have them cached closer to where the where the user is so if um, you're coming in from Europe uh, with your browser hopefully there's a copy on a, a CDN somewhere in Europe or somewhere nearby that can uh, serve that page up if you're doing it in Asia or Africa or South America or North America there are many, many, many points of presence that a lot of content delivery networks have that will cache these pages closer to where the users are. And what that means is um, they will load faster uh, because, you know, it doesn't take a long time for, uh, you know, electrons to move from uh, from here to there, but uh, there is some time and that can be noticeable to the user. So reducing and thinking about largest contentful paint is one of the things that Google is going to be looking at as one of these user experience metrics as they are uh, going into uh, May of this year and rolling that into their index. The, the next thing is a thing called first input delay or FID, and this is really all around interactivity. So when somebody hits, um, you know, taps a button on the smartphone or uh, clicks with their mouse on their desktop, how long does it take for the page to respond once it's once it's set up? And this is something that is literally measured in milliseconds. So Google is saying if this is less than 100 milliseconds, which is one tenth of one second, then okay, you're going to be good on FID. Um, if it's between 100 and 300 milliseconds. Hmm, might want to speed it up a little bit. If it's over 300 milliseconds, the user will almost certainly notice that and it'll feel laggy. It'll feel like they clicked or they tapped and nothing happened for a moment and then and then it happened. So there are some things on the technical back end you can do, um, pushing CSS later into the page load, reducing the size of the CSS, um, really thinking about what external um, third-party libraries and trackers and codes and things are, are embedded in the site. Those are all things that can fit into FID. And again, we're trying to, to handle some of this stuff at the, at the platform level as well to uh, take care of, of some of those things. Uh, this third one is really interesting. And this is the, the last of the three user experience metrics that roll into that Core Web Vitals concept. This is what Google is calling cumulative layout shift or CLS. And it's all around how stable the site is from a, a visual standpoint. And the probably the best example is here, if you're on your if you're on your mobile, you are about to click on a button just as you're about to click an ad slides in above it, the button pushes down, and you accidentally click on the ad instead. That's a bad user experience, and that is the example of cumulative layout shift that they are looking at. And so what they are trying to do is make sure that things are not jumping around and moving around as the page is going through its loading process. That concept is um, they've got a, a big mathematical formula on the back end of how big is the image, how much does it move, how much of the viewport does it cover, host of other factors to come up with this. Um, bottom line is try to load things in place, try to load them, even if you're loading placeholders at the size that they are going to be, so things don't jump around when other things are, are loading into the page, and try and get that CLS number below uh, 0 0.1. This is very difficult in some cases and really need to sort of look at how the page is loading and reacting and if things are coming in asynchronously, uh, this is one of the things that you really need to look at and try to and try to tune. So 
from there, um, again, that's one of the big things that Google is doing from a user experience perspective, and they're going to be bringing that into their metrics in, uh, as far as a an official ranking factor in May of, of this year. So something to, uh, to start to get ready for. The other is um, starting to think about just in general, this last year has been weird. It's been really different than you know any year for the most part in the last hundred years. And so a lot of consumer behavior has changed, especially with respect to how consumers are interacting with, with websites. And so a few things to, to notice and think about. So the first is um, buying behaviors have changed. There are you know, certain types of products like propane heaters um, that are now hot, hot, hot commodities that we never would have perhaps expected a year ago. There are a lot of different trends in buying behavior that people need to be thinking about and are looking to the website to, to help them answer. So the first is consumers are expecting up to the minute updates. And this is everything from is the you know shop open, is it shut? If it's a restaurant or other type of place where people gather, is there indoor or outdoor availability? And especially, you know, here in the states, it's you know down to a state by state or county by county level, and uh, they've been changing very rapidly, literally on a, a weekly basis. What protocols are shops having with respect to um, COVID safety and and hygiene and the like? So all of those things fit in as well. And people are coming to the website to understand what is a shop doing. People are also wanting to be able to choose their fulfillment method, whether they want items delivered, whether a shop opens uh, up and offers curbside pickup, are there other types of options? And a very interesting thing tying back into how Google has started to address this is they are starting to integrate more of this information in multiple ways, actually right into the, the search engine results page. So take a, an example here of a, a shop called The Dry Cleaner. They have a number of different store locations. If you go to their site, um, first thing that you see is, okay, you know, important notice, this is in uh, the province of Ontario in Canada. When they had this page updated uh, fairly recently, you know, due to the Ontario mandated lockdown, hours have been adjusted and you need to look for your local the dry cleaner location um, to see what their hours are going to be because they change rapidly. And so if you click through on the site, they've done a lot of nice things. They've actually integrated a map into the site itself. So if you know where you are on the planet, you can dive down and see if their particular location near you, what their protocols and hours and such are. If you dig in further, you can actually get down to the particular shop level and you can even dig in on there and get into here are the particular hours for this particular shop for this particular day of the week and get into all of that. And all of this needs to be able to be updated again almost on a, a daily or weekly basis. And so it needs to be very, very, very flexible in, in order for them to um, take care of um, their customers and make sure this information is is communicated. This fits in in a really interesting way with what Google is doing because what they are starting to do now is take some of this information that's on the website and pull it up front actually into the search engine results page. So if you were to go into Google and search Piccolo Ristorante uh, Belmore, this uh, a restaurant in Belmore, New York, you would get their, their page. You would see a number of things in addition to just sort of the, you know, Google My Business style uh, information about location and things. First is Google is starting to pull forward things like, you know, do you want to order pickup? Do you want to order delivery? Since Google knows this is a restaurant and they've actually tied into all of the schema or metadata that is sort of behind the page, they know that this restaurant has an online menu and the URL where it was. And you can actually update this and go into Google or go into your website and in some cases push this information out to Google. But when we start thinking about user behavior, um, 
the website is key because a most of the time that's where people are going to end up after a search secondly it is also becoming really the data information hub for google to pull all of this information out and so it needs to have the information there in a format that google can understand it and read it and pull it up and hopefully display it for you know the shop that we are interested in as opposed to their competitors similarly when somebody does come to the site google is now really really driving on this user experience so they're they're really trying to optimize for two things one on-site user experience using those core web vitals metrics we talked about secondly the sort of machine readable bits underneath the site that Google can then pick up and integrate into both its ranking algorithms as well as its display presence on uh, on pages like this. So, okay, a lot of stuff happening. Um, there are a few trends for the sites that have really done this well over the last year. So the ones that have done it well, they have, number one put forth their available service options and kept those up to date in real time on the website so if it is a um, a restaurant or other similar type of business do they have dine-in or takeout um, if it is any kind of physical goods type of business are they doing delivery do they do regular delivery do they do contactless delivery um, do they offer curbside pickup if it is offering digital products or experiences, are they able to integrate online classes and such into their website? Are they handling things like membership where somebody can sign up and have access to particular pieces of content that folks who are not signed up or, or who are not customers don't have access to? All of those things fit in as well. Being able to not just display these things, but again, do that tight integration using various integrations, APIs, and the like into these other types of systems. So the website is no longer just the brochure. It is actually tying into the whole rest of the business. So things like booking and scheduling, if you are a home services uh, or field services type provider, provider that sends people out to people's homes, being able to schedule at a time that works for them around their, you know, their life schedule or their work from home schedule if they are doing that. Um, supporting online ordering. Once something is done and the button has been clicked, what is the status of that order? Has it been received? Is it in process? Is it in transit? Has it been delivered? Is there a confirmation? Those are all things that people are now expecting to be able to go to a website and for their particular self, for their particular order, they wanna be able to have visibility and transparency into those things. When we are looking at physical items and e-commerce in particular, in stock, out of stock, hugely important right now as we saw from the example before you know who would have thought that propane heaters would be a, a hot commodity and you might not be able to to purchase them or there might be back ordered those are all the types of things that you need to be thinking about and making sure that if there is an e-commerce component to the website that those things are being uh, set up and shared and transparent to customers as well for places either with a physical location or if people are coming and delivering from the shop to the home what are the safety protocols that they are implementing so um, you know masking yes or no uh, are there any occupancy limits and again this is so um, sort of location by location dependent some places have opened up uh, completely some places are still trying to uh, to get to that point so it's very rapidly changing and people need to be able to go to the website in order to find those types of things out and last but not least you know really simple things like business hours um, that needs to be visible so customers can can understand it. and these are all things that need to be integrated with the website so customers coming to the site can get it and customers who are perhaps seeing this information on Google can have this information transported out to Google as well. So with all of that, what do you do? What are the particular actions that folks can take in order to address those changes? So the first is 
um, really thinking about web design and making sure that the overall process for um, for the agency, for you know a platform that's providing websites for the end user, that it's very straightforward in order to make information updates and very flexible to bring that new information in. So that is definitely first and foremost. Um, the second is where there are new parts of the, the business model and business process that might not have had to be mediated through the website previously, those things need to be connected in. So for example, appointment scheduling, this is one of those things that might have been an afterthought before. Now, since everything is so scheduled and sometimes it's in person, sometimes it's remote, all of it has to happen at a particular time. Being able to do things like integrate appointment scheduling into the site is critical and tying in with the broader schedules of the organization. So customers have the, their expectations, employees know where they need to be, and all of those things can, can stay in sync. It is impossible to handle all of those things without that kind of integration with the website now. These user experience concerns from core web vitals are really important. So number one, again, making sure whatever that big thing is that's above the fold or in the viewport when the site is loading, make sure that thing is optimized to try to reduce largest contentful paint, making sure that the site is snappy and responsive from a technical standpoint to address that first input delay parameter, making sure that the site is visually stable and buttons aren't jumping around to address that cumulative layout shift aspect. Those are all things that are in there. And again, diving into both the platform that's supporting the site as well as things that you might be able to do on the front end as well. So making sure that file sizes are reduced, making sure that there aren't too many third-party scripts that are coming in and doing things, making sure that whatever host or platform uh, is providing the site has been thinking about these things. And again, especially on mobile, making sure that visual stability aspect is something that is taken into account. And then last but not least, um, there are entire workshops that can be done on Google Schema. What Google Schema, again, is, is the sort of technical representation of a lot of this information like ours, like FAQs, like COVID protocols. Google has actually set up um, particular formats for those that are able to be integrated in a website and then machine readable so that they can pick it up and both integrate it into their search engine rankings, but also integrate it into things like that search uh, engine results page that we saw with the Piccolo Restaurante example, and actually pull those things forward. And so thinking about Google Schema is another very tangible thing that, uh, that can be done to figure out how to make this stuff easier for both customers and, uh, and Google to be, uh, to be looking at. So with that, I'm going to switch back over here and sort of really open it up, um, Stephanie, back to you for, uh, for Q&A and uh, look forward to uh, talking about some, some questions. Yeah. So, well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Chris. I think it's, it's, been, it's been really dense. Uh, I'm sure some people uh, still have to digest, you know, all the uh, all the information. But it's a uh, it's super important and interesting because uh, because uh, this is going to drive a lot of the uh, small businesses or enterprise digital presence in the coming months. So we're getting some questions. Uh, I'm Definitely. just going to ask the first one. Oh, yeah. You want to ask? I have a really long question that sent, came to me. Uh, hi guys, this is Kimberly behind the scenes today in German. So I just reached out to two of my German colleagues because there was one way I was trying to, uh, to get the word to explain it. Um, the, the statement in the question is, Chris, that the SMBs just went through a transition into e-commerce, okay? And they're just changing their websites. And in German, what they had asked is, isn't isn't Google gemeint, okay? You know, aren't they mean? Or isn't this kind of like, 
they're changing all this with the, I mean, um, the LCP is normal, we need speed, but with, with the FIP and the other user experience, isn't this a lot to throw on SMBs all at the same time as they're transitioning? So, um, yes, it absolutely is. And there are, um, these are, these are hard, in some cases, hard technical problems mm -hmm. to solve as well. And it's, um, it's actually the perfect question because this is something that, um, Google is putting out there and the SMBs, the end users, the people who have the, the websites, they're the ones who have to deal with this. They're the ones who have to figure out how this stuff works. And so um, it is it is difficult. There are um, there are some resources out there. And again, this is a place where if uh, you know an organization is working with an agency partner or platform provider, um, those are places where some guidance might be able to be um, given because, again, you know, I, you know, broadly generalizing, um, a business owner wants to run their business. And if their business is not running the website, um, they don't want to, you know, spend hours trying to figure these types of things out. And so, either working, you know, again, with a, a platform provider that is thinking about these things and trying to handle as many of them as possible, really in the infrastructure, because a lot of these Google experience metrics that they're looking at do connect tightly to infrastructure. Um, that is one way, or again, working with, um, you know, an agency to to help tune these things. And they are, you know, they, they, thankfully did give google did give a little bit of warning on this they did note it um last year that said um yes this is a lot for them to be throwing at smbs who are already trying to just figure out how to keep their business going and now have to be thinking about all of these as well and so um yeah the the point and the and the question is is well taken yeah, so I, I fully agree on that, and uh, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna ask two other questions that you we got from the chat. But before I do that, uh, just wanted to point out, you know, on the so not only on the new indexes, but on the mobile first index that is going to be in place if I got you correctly by the end of this month. So it's a I mean, we did the, the Cinda landscape survey a few a few months a, a few weeks ago, and uh, we presented on that, and uh, we it showed that uh, SMBs have transitioned to mobile because of the COVID uh, situation, but not all of them. I mean, there are still some uh, small businesses in Europe, especially depending on the countries who haven't had. Uh, who don't have their mobile optimization in place. So does this mean that they're going to be out of the ranking uh, page? So it can have a significant uh, impact. They are going to be looking at whatever that mobile experience is first, and that's the thing that they are going to be ranking on. So if their page is not well optimized for, for mobile, especially uh, if their competitors are, they definitely may see a, uh, a decline in their rankings. The best way to understand um, sort of if this has already happened is, again, going to that Google Search Console tool that Google has and going down to that settings area and seeing which crawler they are using today that Google is using today in order to index that site. So they have been moving this way for a while. It is highly likely that the sites are already being indexed mobile first, as again, you know, uh, showed in the example, I believe our site has been indexed mobile first for um, about two or three years at this point, but it's one of those things where they you know, have announced by the end of March, they have said, uh, at least to date, that is the, the cutover date for that. So the, the best way to know if there is likely to be a significant impact is go into Google Search Console, 
see which version of the crawler is being used on their site to index it today. And then from there, sort of, um, you know, plan accordingly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so uh, one question from the floor. So if you're an, on an online only business, what does Google look for specifically in regards to ranking? So there are, um, you know, there are last I saw, you know, literally two to three hundred or more ranking factors that they that they bring in. Um, the the thing to remember and sort of zooming way, way, way out is. Having content that addresses a searcher's intent what are they mm -hmm. what problem are they are they trying to solve and having content that answers that that problem and it really depends from industry to industry it really depends on where the sort of user is in their search journey so there might be um, general types of searches that are looking just for you know general information um, you know you know, tell me about butterflies or mm. or something like that. Um, there can be very, very specific information. Um, I am looking for a um, blue shirt in men's medium, um, you know, in this particular location. Mm. And so making sure that it's understood what are the particular searcher intents what are the the particular mm -hmm. questions that they are trying to answer and then making sure that the content on the page answers that as completely as possible while still providing a a good user experience and the best way to um you know without diving into the the deep 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 parts of um search engine optimization when you're searching with your browser the Google algorithm, usually if you're in your sort of normal browser, it is looking at your search history and using that to try to optimize and tune the results to what it thinks mm -hmm. you in particular are looking for. If you want to see what a general user is looking for, um, any of the browsers, there is usually a private mode or an incognito mode that you can go into. And putting yourself in your, you know, in your user's shoes, type in what they might be looking for and then see what the top you know 10 pages what do they look like what questions are they answering what um, types of layout do they have are they using a lot of images are they using mostly text are they um, sort of bullet point frequently asked questions list or are they um, you know displays of visual inspiration and a portfolio type of thing it's really you know it's it's tough to to generalize but one first step can be going in and putting yourself in the user's shoes typing in what you believe they would be typing in and then taking a look at say those first 10 results to see what are the common traits of those because whatever those traits are for that search term that's what google is using to rank that particular search. Um, these things around core web vitals and experience, it is important to note that it is likely, again, you know, there are hundreds of ranking factors that fit into the Google algorithm. And the things around core web vitals, if the content isn't there first, um, it can be really fast, but it's not going to yeah. rank well. The core web vitals will be more of a tiebreaker, mm -hmm. uh, all things else being mm -hmm. mostly equal. Yeah, so content first, core web, core web vitals second, or you know, first second, if I can say so, and then and then uh, yeah. then you need to deal with. And going back to the to the questions of images, so would you recommend to use only static images in order to improve the optimization? So it um, again, it's a it's an it depends question. Um, mm -hmm. Google tries to, you know, optimize for all of those those things. If you are going through and you are seeing those types of um, 
Core Web Vitals and other performance metrics and the images are the things that are slowing down the site, then you may want to mm. find ways to optimize those. So, um, you know, things like animated images can be very, very um, large. They can be, you know, hundreds of uh, K, they can be, you know, a megabyte or multiple mm. megabytes. And especially if someone is on a slow connection or coming in over mobile, um, it will take a very long time to move those things over the wire. And so, again, there's not a, a general rule of thumb um, other than really make sure that it is providing value. Um, if possible, if you do want to be using those types of big uh, images or using um, big heavy animations, um, perhaps pushing them down lower on the mm -hmm. page can help because things like that largest contentful paint, the way I understand it today, is I believe it's looking at just the stuff that's in the screen that is going to show up when the view mm -hmm. when the uh, the user lands on the page. So you can push some of those things down lower on the page if you really need to communicate those more uh, complex concepts or give that kind of emotion that you might need to um, pull from uh, a richer piece of media like that. Yeah, also taking into account the, the mobile uh, optimization also, because I mean, what, what you're saying for the screen works also for the for the mobile screen. So uh, yeah, makes sense to push a little bit the content down. Okay, uh, okay. I have another question. I think Kim has another one too. I have another one yeah. that I have, to, I have to try to ask again, <laughs> translate. <Go ahead>. Um, <laughs> So um, for some reason, people are sending me this <laughs> in the chat. Uh, um, so Chris, uh, you talked about cumulative layout shift, and and I guess the question the question here is when I when I put it together is doesn't that mean that there that the the design and layout of the website is becoming more important if Google likes it or not? And um, isn't that kind of a, a long-term process for SMBs? And how are they going to meet these requirements? So um, a, lot to, a lot to unpack in there. So yes, they are definitely looking at the interaction part of the design around Cumulative layout shift, and what they are what they are looking for there. The the term they use is visual stability. So once the mm -hmm. once someone starts to see the page, um, does it not do the the elements on the page not not move around? And so using a um, you know for SMBs choosing a um, a template or a theme or a layout that has things that are hopefully not going to be moving around. Um, the place again where we see this a lot is twofold. Um, one, if someone is in particular serving ads on their site, sometimes those mm -hmm. ads come in sort of later in the loading process and they come in and sort of push everything else down. So that's one thing to, to watch for. The other is, the way a lot of web pages work now is not everything is sort of loaded in order. Um, you know, the the browser will ask for give me all of the things I need for this web page, and some will come in fast, some will come in slow. And if there's a big thing that comes in slow and it comes in over the other things, it'll come in and sort of push other stuff down. And so the you know the thing that people need to be thinking about there is designing for that stability again especially on on mobile because i think we've all probably had that experience where we think we're clicking on one thing and just as we're about to you know push the um you know push the button on the uh on the smartphone um it moves and something else pops in its place and, and we have a, a bad experience so this is one of those things that google is bringing in and this that cls um is probably the hardest one of the uh, of the three to be uh, to be thinking about and the one that I know you know we at Duda are spending a lot of time trying to figure out how do we optimize our um, how do we optimize our templates to try and reduce that for for folks who are who are building on our platform 
Okay, so you just answered another question we had about uh, what editor changes can we expect from Duda to help uh, apply the new changes? <laughs> yeah, there are, um, so there are a few things I can, I can talk to. So there are some editor changes. Um, the more interesting things that are happening technically are actually happening down at the infrastructure level. So we mm -hmm. are, you know, today we are actually tracking across all of the um, you know many 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 sites that we host um, and serve, we are tracking LCP on average across all of those, and we're looking at the both you know the the average and the median on those. We are looking at the first input delay. We are looking at CLS, and we are actually working on. Um, and our engineers are spending a lot of time working on back-end types of things to do as much of that work automatically as, as possible. And we are literally, you know, weekly putting in new optimizations and trying to actually tune the underlying platform. So ultimately, you know, this gets down to we don't want the SMB to even have to worry about this mm -hmm. because if they're on a data site, it's just going to work. And so that's what really our, our North Star is that we are, are driving toward. And so these are a lot of the things that have to happen at the platform level. And we are trying to take care of as many as, um, as possible. If someone is on a different platform, um, it really depends on the platform. It depends on the hosting provider if they're using an open source solution um, because all of those things fall into play and if the actual technology provider isn't thinking about these things it's going to be nearly impossible for the smb to be successful because this is you know you use the exact right word stephanie this is really dense stuff this is mm -hmm. like you know, if you're, you know, if you're a, a computer scientist, it's like really cool. If you're a business person, it's like, great. It's one more thing I have to worry about. Awesome. Um, and so we're, we're trying to take care of as many of those things on the back end and really at the platform level uh, as we can for, for folks who are building on our platform. Okay. Well, we're, we're getting tons of questions. So I guess you're going to get some direct questions afterwards, but, uh, Another one coming, uh, so are you seeing factors required to optimize for voice search coming through that you need to build into sites? Great question. Um, voice search has been one of those things that people have been talking about for a number of years at this point. Um, we're not seeing a whole, whole lot of it. Um, I'll do some, you know, I'll do some some searching around and see if we can find any any other further data on that. But it's not one of those things, you know. It's it's not in the in the top ten things that mm -hmm. um, that we're hearing about at at this point. So, you know, I know I know it is out there. Um, it was very very, you know, it was it had a lot of buzz uh, a few years ago. Have been hearing a lot less about it uh, more recently. Okay, and then, then another one also on the LCP uh, score. So uh, talking about, you know, video backgrounds on rows that have been re relatively recently introduced. And do you think that this should be avoided in order to, to improve uh, the LCP and, uh, and to reduce the length of the video? Does reducing the length of the video also have an impact? Yeah, it will. Um, it's one of those things that needs to be tested um and again it falls really into a couple of things is it um you know is the video being delivered uh quickly is mm -hmm. it um, you know how how large is it and in particular is it um above the fold and is it one of the things background wise that people are seeing but the you know on a, on a site by site level it's very difficult to generalize the the best way to um, you know, how I would diagnose that would be, you know, put the site into um, the, the web.dev tool or one of the other tools that tracks for core web vitals, um, try a version of it with the video background, see if that seems to be the element on the page mm -hmm. that is causing an LCP challenge if there is um, not 
you know, if, if, if there is an LCP challenge, is that the element that seems to be causing it? And then perhaps test it against, um, you know, another version of the site mm -hmm. that has a static image, then you can, um, you know, you can sort of get actual data that way and see if that is, um, if that is having a factor. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think we, we are going to have to close that soon. I just want to, I, I can't avoid asking you another question, which is, which is a kind of a, a hint into further, I mean, we're, we're already talking about the further steps, but uh, uh, I, we, we know that, you know, the Google is going to change uh, the way they integrate the third party cookies. Uh, they've announced that for uh, for uh, a long time in next year. So this is not included now into the into the rankings at, at all. Do you foresee that this is going to be one of the next you know big changes that they're going to also include into their uh, into their uh, assessment and rankings in uh, in 2022? Yeah, it certainly could be. Um, you know, this is you know it's definitely the the core Web Vitals ones are the ones that they have. Mm -hmm announced um, these areas around you know third-party cookies and privacy all of the the different providers all of the big tech platforms are all taking different angles on it yeah. so it is um, you know we don't until they communicate you know either what they have done or what they are going to do um, you know it's impossible to say for sure but you know, as all of the as all of the big tech platforms are sort of battling it out, um, this will definitely be one of the one of the areas that they are really focusing on. And so, you know, the the I think the overarching idea there is you, wherever possible, need to know your customers and prospects mm -hmm. and actually know who those folks are. And so, if you are again, you know, if you're providing great content. If you know who they are, because maybe they are not customers yet, but they have signed up for a um, a newsletter for you, or you have um, asked them and they have given you permission to stay in contact with them, that is ultimately the best defense mm -hmm. against any of these lower level changes is actually having that connection with the customer, yeah. actually knowing who they are at an actual human level. Yeah, perfect. Well. Thanks very much, Chris. I, I think uh, we, we can end on this note and maybe we can already plan another uh, update in six months because <laughs> this might We'd probably have changed and, uh, and see how everybody copes on that. And uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Thanks for uh, our audience. Thanks to our audience sorry, for, uh, for having followed us today. Don't forget to tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. CET time for, uh, for next uh, Thought Leadership Thursday's updates. And uh, Chris, wish you a very good day. Great, and thank you, and good evening, and thank you again, everybody, for uh, for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day.